ETFs. So what they did was they looked over these five-year annualized return or periods, and they compared the different funds that they offered. So for example, a large cap blend is like the S&P 500 ETF. During that five-year period, the fund uh, had a negative return of 1.4%, not great. The average investor who was invested that entire time, but kept making changes and timing the market, they underperformed. They actually experienced a negative 5.7% return, so they lagged by 4.3%. And it wasn't just the S&P 500. They looked at 79 different ETFs for this five-year period, and they found that 68 of them had uh, returns where the investor lagged what was available in that ETF. And the average lag was 4.5% annualized across all these different ETFs. So, you know, one of the things we have to challenge is when people say, hey, listen, you should fire an advisor, adopt an ETF calculation strategy, you can do it yourself. These people have a tendency to, instead of being do-it-yourself investors, did it to themselves investors, because there's no one there to put their hand on the tiller to say, stick to the plan, right? There's real value in controlling the behavior of investors, which far outweighs the cost differential. So let's re-examine this 30% wealthy argument by firing your advisor. Uh, as part of our research, we built a calculator that allows us to model a whole bunch of different factors like inflation, different savings rates, um, income growth rates, uh, portfolio costs, etc. And what it does is it assumes people uh, uh, contribute to the retirement portfolio until they turn 65, then they start accumulating in equal monthly installments until they turn 90, they write their last check, it bounces, and then they die. So. <laughs> You know, the holy grail of financial planning if you hate your family. Um, and so based on that, we sort of reverse engineered uh, their sort of hypothesis. And then we applied these implicit costs of the behavioral drag or performance of 2%. And so if we go back to the original hypothesis or thesis, which was by your advisor, say 1.33% per year, you end up with 30% more wealth. If you factor in the implicit cost of the behavioral drag using a conservative estimate of 2%, it actually turns out that you would end up with 18% less wealth. So the drive to save explicit costs, if you introduce the implicit drag, which can be greater than the explicit cost savings, you actually end up worse off. So again, some people of the 90% who can't do it themselves, they end up you know, potentially going from do-it-yourself investors to do-it-yourself investors. So now let's take a look at the third pillar. I spent a lot of time on behavior management because I think there's a lot of value to be driven there. The last one is wealth management. This is really where my research has really been focused in on. Um, and the question is, how do you measure the value of wealth management? And let me tell you, this is an exceedingly difficult question to answer. Um, at the end of five years, I probably have more questions than I have answers, but I do have some answers. Uh, so let me give you the gist of the research as to why this is so hard to calculate. So when it comes to wealth management, the first problem is that there are multiple factors. It's not just portfolio management. We look at things like debt management, retirement planning, portfolio management, life insurance, disability, tax planning, emergency funding status, estate planning, education savings, major purchases, and more. But there's multiple factors. So that's hard enough as it is to sort of quantify how well people are doing across these different dimensions. But beyond that, what makes it you know, uh, a quantum leap more difficult is that each of these factors the importance varies depending on the individual. So how important these factors are to an individual depends on where they are in their personal journey. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's use disability insurance as an example. So we know, of course, the benefits of disability insurance, but let's say you had someone who was 64 years old and didn't have disability insurance, but everything else was fine. So they been saving diligently and whatnot. If they became disabled, it's not the end of the world. They're one year away from retirement. They're effectively self-insured at this point. It's not a big deal, right? So whether or not they have disability insurance coverage and the appropriate amount and they're 64, not that important. But if you're 24 and you don't have disability insurance, if you were to become disabled, you're screwed for life. You're basically guaranteed to be broke. So the importance of whether or not you have disability insurance coverage when you're 24 is phenomenal. So the weighting of that one factor has to be expanded in our model to account for where this person is in their journey. And all these different factors have their different sensitivity loadings that we had to calculate. When it comes to portfolio costs, it's not sensitive to age, it's sensitive to the size of the portfolio because you could be 60 and starting to save for the first time and a 4% MER is like dollars, right? If you're just starting a pack plan. You can be 24 and just have inherited 10 million bucks. Then the portfolio structure of the AMERs or whatever, 
That's phenomenally important, right? So each of these factors has a different sensitivity loading. So what that means is, and don't worry about this next slide, uh, we had to build a dynamically sensitive multi-factor model, which basically means we have multiple factors of wealth, and each of these is dynamically sensitive to where people are in their own personal financial journey. So again, don't worry about that. What you need to know is that the output that we can create with this basically says we can give everyone one number. We normalize it out of 100 and we can go to anyone, take some input and say your number is 50, your number is 70, yours is 90. And based on people like you, so you can have young people with the scores of 90 or 20. You can have old people with scores of 90 or 20. It all depends on how well you're doing compared to people like you. So then, the next step of the research is taking this framework for value and applying it to see what the impact is of different channels of advice. So this would entail what's called a diff in diff study, a difference in differences. So what this means is, you know, when you take a look at all the industry studies that are published that says, hey, people with financial advisors have more money, those are cute, but those are just correlational because if you have money, that's when advisors look for you. And if, you're, if you have money, that's also when you tend to seek advice. So there's a huge selection bias. So it's just a correlation. We want to know who is responsible for people's wealth changing. And so what this diff and diff study does, we want to see what is the difference in this number? How does this number change over time, depending on the different channel of advice you go through? Full service, DIY, robo, whatever. So here is a hypothetical example of what that might look like. So what we're looking at is two channels. The columns are the two channels out of like 10. So I'm just breaking it down two to two just to show you the, the, the framework. And then as we go uh, top to bottom across those rows, we have these different factors of wealth. So when it comes to debt management, let's say you've got someone, they've got 200 bucks per month and they go to a robo-advisor. The robo-advisor is not going to say, don't give us your money, pay down your credit card instead. Their business model doesn't work if they recommend that. So they may not change your score on your debt management. Whereas if you go to a full service advisor, they might say, hey, listen, instead of putting that 200 bucks to your RSP right now, you should pay down your credit card balance because you're paying 25% interest. And so their score on the debt management factor might increase by four points over time. If you look at retirement planning, maybe, for example, a robo advisor gives you a cursory retirement projection, increases your score by four points. Full service, maybe if you get a bit more detail, increase it by seven. Maybe portfolio management is a wash because that is uh, what they're centered around is constructing portfolios. But if you go down the list of all these different factors, there are a lot of these factors where a robo right now will not move the needle, right? So there's a lot of zeros there in that column, whereas full service has the opportunity to make a difference on all these different factors of wealth if you are truly holistic in how you approach your practice. So focus just on the bottom line, and we're looking at the total point differential in this hypothetical example. A robo-advisor might move someone's score up by 13 points over a period of time. Full service might move it by 48 points. So when someone says, yeah, but a full service advisor, a human advisor is twice the cost of a robo, but if the value difference is three to four times, it changes the calculus. Right? So in the absence of a framework for value, people can only focus in on cost. But once we have a framework for value, people are not dumb. They know things are not free. If you show them the value, they are willing to pay for it. So um, here are the three pillars that I described. Portfolio management, there's only so much value you can add incrementally here because portfolio management is basically commoditized. You can outsource that right now. You should probably be spending more time on managing the behavior of your clients. So some of those techniques that I addressed earlier, you can apply those right now in your practice. And when it comes to wealth management, you need to focus on more than just one or two factors of wealth. I know a lot of advisors are just insurance focused or just investment focused. Some are both. You need to do more than just those two factors if you want to have a higher value proposition. The future of financial advice is hybrid advice, right? So it's not, there's some growth in robo-advisors, sure. Uh, we know that there's some disintermediation threats to uh, the full service model, but really, just like the ATM when it was introduced, it opens up opportunities, right? So if you can outsource the menial tasks to technology, so you can focus on the higher touch aspects of providing value, you can actually use technology to your advantage. And I think there's a massive room for growth in the hybrid model, which is human-centric, digitally assisted. And so based on my research, and these findings, 
we launched Money Gaps. And Money Gaps is a hybrid advisor platform. It's a platform for advisors to help you deliver better advice using this research. So we started after you know, doing the initial research, I then hired an innovation lab, and we picked apart every aspect of the client advisor relationship. We tore it down and we rebuilt it from scratch based on, get this, asking people what they actually wanted instead of telling them. So what we found was, when we tested with clients and advisors, we asked them about you know, the, the client advisor relationship, we identified a number of pain points. And since the biggest common pain point, you probably will intuitively understand this. Nobody reads financial plans. So we talked to a lot of advisors, they spent a lot of time creating big financial plans, and they complained that their clients didn't read them. We talked to clients and we said, how do you feel about getting these big financial plans? They said, we don't read them. We asked people, how many times do you read your financial plan? The average was less than one. So a lot of people get these big plans and they just, they're not invested in that process. So they wanted something different. Now, I'm not saying that financial planning is bad, far from it. I think financial planning is the future, but we need to reimagine how we do it. There are some people who need really complex, comprehensive financial plans, but these are the people who are within a few years of a major money milestone, like retirement, selling a business, something big that they really want detailed analysis. For 80% of everyone else, they just want to know, am I on track? Compared to people like me, what are the big gaps in my life, and am I on track? So what we did was, instead of giving people a giant financial plan, we have a one-page financial report card, which is intuitive. People understand what an overall GPA is, and they understand a report card. So, for example, for every category of their financial life, because we have a framework for measuring value and these different factors of wealth, we can tell people, you've got an A in life insurance, or an F in estate planning, an A in disability, etc. And then there are some teacher's notes that tells them, you know, just like a teacher's note or report card, what you need to do to improve or where you sort of stand. So it's very simple, very intuitive, and it was designed so that if you print it, put it on a table, a client will intuitively understand it without having to answer, ask any questions. That was our goal, make it radically simple. People love it. What did advisors want? In addition to having simplified reporting of a financial plan, uh, because what they found was they make big financial plans and then they always spend more time making a synopsis of the financial plan, and that's the only thing that gets read, we just went straight to the synopsis. The other thing they wanted was help with prospecting and a better user experience for clients because the next generation of financial consumer demands a different experience than the previous generation. So what we did was we made a mobile optimized 90 second snapshot survey that you can send out to people and it basically asks them 15 questions, takes 90 seconds, and it's very simple, yes, no, I don't know questions, covering the gamut of financial planning. Do you have a will? When's the last time you checked your credit report? Have you had a retirement income projection uh, completed? Do you have an emergency fund? Questions of that nature, and what they get is a very simple traffic light dashboard, yellow light, green light, red light, which looks at all the different aspects of their life. And what this is designed to do is to start to shift their mind that financial advice is only about being sold investments or insurance, and it's more holistic in nature. And what we found was with this tool, so this is just the prospecting tool that we built, um, we find that it's being used in three ways. Obviously finding new clients by sharing the link on email signatures, uh, social media advertising, on their website, e-newsletter, etc. Obviously that's table stakes. But we also find that there's a ton of potential in people's own book of clients. And so we ran an experiment with a few advisors and I said, why don't you try this? Why don't you ask your entire client base that you are testing out some new software, send out this link, ask them to complete the survey to give you their thoughts. And what ended up happening was these advisors are finding way more revenue potential inside their own book of clients who they have not provided full financial planning to. So it's opening up questions about, oh yes, you know what, we need to review my life insurance, or yes, I need help with setting up an estate plan, can you refer me to a lawyer? And then the third one is, it's really hard to get referrals, right, as you know. And what we found was this tool is actually being used to generate referrals because in that email where we said, test this out, send it out, ask people to test it out for you, and if you like it, send it to your friends and family if you think they would appreciate a 90 second snapshot of their overall financial life. It's a lot easier to send a link to a friend and family member than it is to ask them, hey, my financial advisor is looking for new clients, would you like? They don't do that, right? But forwarding a link, very easy. And when you forward that link, someone can please you get their contact information, etc. The last thing that we wanted to focus in on is automating the menial tasks for advisors. So we automatically generate the reason why letters. So you take all the inputs required to do a proper life insurance needs analysis. At the click of a button, it generates an automatic reason why letter. 
Uh, we have a three.